I'm Larry Dean, the director of the University of Washington Regional Heart Center. I'd like to welcome all of you to um, the University of Washington Regional Heart Center Grand Rounds. The patient for today will be presented by Dr. Jeannie Vesey, a member of the Division of Cardiology at the University of Washington uh, Medical Center. Dr. Vesey. Thank you, Dr. Dean. The patient being presented today is a 60-year-old gentleman. He presented with, originally four years ago, with a dyspnea on exertion, lower extremity edema, and fatigue. This has been increasing over the past three months. He now has class three to four heart failure symptoms. He also notes increasing ascites. He's had right lower lobe collapse due to his pleural effusions. His past medical history is only significant for hypertension and hemorrhoids. His family history is unremarkable. His medications currently are Lasix 60 milligrams a day, spironolactone 75 milligrams a day. On physical exam, his weight is 100.7 kilograms. His blood pressure is 122 over 90, heart rate 76. His jugular venous pressure is markedly elevated at greater than 14 centimeters. His heart exam reveals a normal S1, S2. No murmurs appreciated, but he does have a diastolic heart sound. He has heart's regular rate and rhythm. He's got di good distal pulses throughout. His chest exam reveals decreased breath sounds and dullness at the right base. Otherwise, his lung exam is clear. His extremities, he has trace lower extremity edema. His EKG is notable for normal sinus rhythm with diffuse T wave inversions throughout the precordium. Seen here. The majority of his workup was done year, three years prior, and it included an echocardiogram, which revealed normal left ventricular size. He had global mild hypokinesis. He had a mildly reduced right ventricular systolic function and elevated right heart pressures. Right heart catheterization was performed, and that revealed uh, markedly elevated right heart pressures with a right atrial pressure of 17. Pulmonary capillary wedge pressure was 23. Pulmonary artery pressures were 42 over 23, and cardiac index was 2.6. He had coronary arteriography performed, which revealed normal coronary arteries. In addition, endomyocardial biopsy was performed, which revealed normal myocardium without evidence of fibrosis, inflammation, amyloid, or iron deposition. He had an anti-nuclear antibody, which was negative, PPD was negative, and he had normal serum and urine protein electrophoresis. An MRI was performed, which revealed focal mild thickening of the pericardium of 5 to 6 millimeters along the base and mid-portion of the ventricle, or the ventricle was sparing of the apex. MRI repeated currently is without change. The patient was referred for cardiac catheterization and hemodynamic assessment. And the question to be answered by this cardiac catheterization is, is this constrictive pericarditis in this patient versus a restrictive cardiomyopathy? And would the patient benefit from surgery? I'd like to invite Dr. Stephen L. Goldberg, uh, interventional cardiologist and associate professor of medicine here at the University of Washington to discuss the cardiac catheterization findings. Dr. Goldberg. Thank you, Dr. Vesey. Right and heart, uh, left heart catheterizations were performed, and on this diagram you can see the hemodynamic uh, findings. There are elevated filling pressures across uh, each of the cardiac chambers. The right atrial mean pressure was 27. The right ventricular pressure was 65, and end diastolic pressure of 30. Pulmonary artery pressure was 65 over 35. Had pulmonary, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure was 32. The left ventricular pressure was 135 with an end diastolic pressure of 28, the aortic pressure of 130 over 75, 
A thermodilution cardiac output was performed, which was 6 liters per minute with a cardiac index of 2.9, and he had a heart rate of 70. I'd like to uh, discuss the uh, hemodynamic evaluation for constrictive pericarditis. And there are five traditional criteria that have been used to identify constrictive pericarditis. I'm going to present them along with a mathematical descriptor uh, for each of these criteria. The first one is the well-known diastolic equalization of pressures, which can be uh, mathematically described as a difference between the left ventricular and right ventricular end diastolic pressures of less than 5 millimeters of mercury. The second criteria is the uh, dip and plateau diastolic pressure or square root sign that is seen in the right and left ventricular uh, tracings. The Kussmaul sign is a lack of an inspiratory fall in mean right atrial pressure, sometimes seen as an elevation in the right atrial pressure with inspiration. There is purported to be a lack of significant uh, pulmonary hypertension defined as a pulmonary artery pressure less than 55 millimeters of mercury. And finally, there is a narrow right ventricular pulse pressure defined as a right ventricular end diastolic pressure uh, over a systolic pressure ratio of greater than one-third. I'd like to go over the hemodynamic tracings from our patient. Here we can see simultaneous pressures of the right atrium uh, right here and the left ventricle focusing in on the diastolic component. Uh, we are on a 50 scale with each of these lines representing five millimeters uh, difference. We've selected the right atrium and the left ventricle because that represents the inflow and outflow chambers of the heart, and you can see that there is less than five millimeters difference during diastole between these chambers. I'd also like to point out the steep X and Y descents that are seen in the uh, right atrial pressure tracing, which is characteristic for constrictive uh, pericarditis, giving, giving us this characteristic W uh, shape. Here are simultaneous right and left ventricular uh, tracings demonstrating the square root sign as well as the left ventricular and right ventricular equalization. At this location, we can see the characteristic rapid early filling wave uh, which occurs in the ventricles, which is due to the tethering effect of the pericardium pulling the uh, ventricular muscle back into uh, its uh, diastolic configuration at the end of systole. Because the muscle is, is itself uh, quite compliant, it allows this to occur, and so there is a steep drop in the early part of diastole. Because of the restraining effect of the uh, constricted pericardium, however, the pressure uh, rises to a high level and uh, it plateaus off, giving us the late plateau uh, characteristic. On this uh, uh, graph, we can also see the uh, right ventricular uh, systolic and diastolic pressures in order to calculate our uh, pulse pressure. And we can see that the uh, pulse pressure is going to be, uh, ratio will be 30 over 60, which is one half, which is greater than the mathematical cutoff of one third. And thus, uh, our third criteria for uh, constrictive pericarditis is uh, seen. Here are simultaneous pressures from the uh, pulmonary artery and uh, aorta. And uh, in this tracing, we can see that the pulmonary artery pressure in systole is just above our cutoff of 55, so we do not meet this particular uh, criteria. So uh, out of the four that we've looked at, we have met three out of the four. Interesting to note that uh, there is an inspiratory uh, drop in uh, the aortic pressure uh, consistent with a pulsus paradoxus which is an inconsistent finding with constrictive pericarditis. In this tracing, we are demonstrating the hemodynamic Kussmaul sign by having the patient uh, take a breath and hold it uh, while measuring pressures in the right atrial chamber. And you can see that with uh, uh, this maneuver, the right atrial pressure actually rises. Now, the mechanism for the Kussmaul sign is uh, rather interesting. Uh, when an individual, any of us, takes a breath in, we create a negative intrathoracic pressure inside the chest cavity. We also in, uh, create a positive intra-abdominal pressure due to the diaphragmatic excursion into the abdomen. This combination of effects causes a pressure gradient, higher pressure in the inferior vena cava in the abdomen, lower pressure in the inferior vena cava in the right atrium inside the um, 
a chest, and this will tend to push blood into the chest cavity. In a normal person with inspiration, that negative intrathoracic effect is transmitted to the pericardium and the intrapericardial chambers, and therefore there will be a drop in pressure uh, in the uh, uh, cardiac chambers. In somebody with a constrictive pericardium, there is an attenuation of this negative intrathoracic pressure effect on the cardiac chambers. Therefore, there is less of a drop in the pressures in the heart chambers um, <coughs> with constriction. Because of the increased flow which occurs, for the reasons that I mentioned a moment ago, there's increased blood going into the uh, chest and into the right atrium, but there is an attenuation of the negative uh, pressure effect uh, in the uh, right atrium from the intrathoracic pressure. This will cause a elevation in the pressure in the right atrium, and which is characteristic of the Kussmaul sign. On this slide, we demonstrate a hepatojugular reflux on our patient. By compressing the abdomen, we have created some of the same characteristics that I just described with the uh, Kussmaul sign, and there, uh, the similarity in these tracings shows the similar mechanism uh, which is ongoing. We have increased the abdominal pressure, pushing the blood from the inferior vena cava into the chest cavity and causing a rise in the uh, right atrial pressure. Well, how good are these traditional criteria at identifying constrictive pericarditis? And as Dr. Verrier has mentioned in a previous conference, they're not very good. Here, the Mayo Clinic uh, presented a series of 39 uh, patients with constriction or other uh, forms of right heart failure and looking at each of these five uh, traditional criteria. You can see that the uh, sensitivity of these criteria are not necessarily that bad, but the specificity of seen he here is actually quite low. They're not terribly accurate at identifying constrictive pericarditis compared to other causes of right heart failure. However, in the last few years, we've had a new appreciation and understanding of some of the complex relationships between intrathoracic pressure and intracardiac pressures when a constrictive uh, pericardium is present. We can first look at the pressure of the pulmonary capillary wedge tracing. Now, if you, as you recall, to measure pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, we have taken our catheter and gone through the right heart chambers and then exited the pericardial space out to the pulmonary artery. Therefore, that negative intrathoracic pressure, which occurs with inspiration, is transmitted to our catheter in the pulmonary capillary wedge position. However, there is an attenuation of that fact effect in the intracardiac chambers like the left ventricle. Therefore, with inspiration, there is more of a drop in the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure than there is in the left ventricle during diastole, and this will create a gradient difference, a dynamic gradient between the pulmonary capillary wedge uh, and the uh, left ventricle. And this can be shown on this uh, tracing from our patient where there is simultaneous pulmonary capillary wedge pressure tracing, and left ventricular tracings. We can see that when the patient takes an inspiration, the gradient has come down. And we can tell he's taken an inspiration because you can see the drop in the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And here is the gradient with inspiration, and here is the gradient when he is done with his inspiration during exhalation. And you can see that there is an increase in the gradient during exhalation. Well, this is not only an interesting finding, but this is, in fact, an important mechanism of blood flow. Because of this decreased uh, gradient during inspiration, there is going to be less blood flow filling the left ventricle because of uh, the uh, reduced gradient. Here are a couple of examples of patients with cardiac disease who do not have constriction with uh, simultaneous uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and left ventricular pressure tracings. And you can see that uh, in each of these conditions, with a inspiration, there is a drop in the pulmonary capillary wedge, but there's a similar drop in the left ventricular uh, uh, pressure tracings. And you can see that here as well. Thus, the gradient is not significantly different in other conditions because that negative intrathoracic uh, pressure drop with inspiration is transmitted to the cardiac chambers. Well, because of the decreased gradient which occurs with inspiration filling the left ventricle, and because of the increased flow which occurs 
into the right heart with inspiration, as I explained before in explaining the Kussmaul sign. There is more blood flow going to the right ventricle with inspiration. There is decreased blood flow going into the left ventricle with inspiration. Compounding this or accentuating this, the myocardium is not particularly involved with constriction, particularly the intraventricular septum remains its compliance and is, uh, its elasticity. And therefore, as the flow uh, increases in the right ventricle, there is a shift of the ventricular septum accentuating the differences between the right ventricle filling and the left ventricular filling. This can be seen on the uh, echocardiograms with uh, careful uh, respiratory appreciation of the uh, ventric uh, ventricular septum. This combination of increased flow into the right ventricle and decreased flow into the left ventricle causes a difference in the ability of those ventricles to uh, uh, eject blood, and therefore the systolic pressures are significantly affected. Therefore, in a constrictive situation with inspiration, the left ventricular systolic pressure drops with inspiration, whereas the right ventricular systolic pressure rises with inspiration, and therefore we have what is called discordance or respiratory discordance of the left and right ventricular systolic pressures. I'd like to contrast that with uh, a patient who has a restrictive cardiomyopathy, whereby as the right ventricular pressure drops with inspiration, the left ventricular pressure drops with inspiration, and the opposite occurs with exhalation as opposed to the appearance in our patient here. So how accurate are these new, uh, excuse me, these new criteria for diagnosing constrictive pericarditis? And from this series from the Mayo Clinic, you can see that actually their specificity for these criteria are actually quite high. Uh, and in fact, in particular, looking at left and right ventricular interdependence, the specificity is 95%. Uh, I'd now like to uh, turn off the slides for a moment and show uh, one shot of the coronary angiogram of our patient here, if I may. This is a shot of the uh, left coronary artery in an REO view. Here's the left anterior descending coronary artery, and this is the circumflex. And you can see that with cardiac motion, there's a normal bounce of the uh, uh, left anterior descending. You can see that it uh, constricts, but that the circumflex is immobile. It's not moving at all because it's tacked up against the pericardium by the thickened diseased pericardium uh, restricting its motion here. And this is a characteristic finding in patients with constrictive pericarditis. So based upon the clinical history, the imaging studies, and hemodynamic data, the patient was referred for pericardial stripping. And I'd now like to ask Dr. Ed Verrier, the chief of cardiothoracic surgery and the uh, uh, surgeon on this particular case, to discuss the surgical findings. Thank you, Dr. Verrier. Well, good morning. Um, I have to take it from that complexity that uh, Dr. Goldberg uh, so nicely elucidated to the realm of the surgeon. And for the surgeons, we're a little bit simpler. And we find this diagnosis fairly difficult. And particularly at the University of Washington, where we see a very large number of people with heart failure. And patients with heart failure have it for a number of reasons, one of which is that the sac lining the heart, the pericardium, is thickened or simply restrictive and not allowing the blood to fill into the heart. On the other hand, there are many people who have diseases of the muscle of the heart, what we call the a myocardiopathy, that the problem is primarily the muscle and not the constrictive pericardium around the heart. Restrictive cardiomyopathies are best treated in most instances either with medical therapy, and our heart failure team does a superb job managing them, or ultimately with transplantation because the primary disease of the muscle is not a surgical disease. In contrast, if it's simply a restriction due to a mechanical uh, girdle around the heart, then if you relieve that girdle, these patients do dramatically well. We have definitely made progress in the first last few years in making the distinction between these two disease processes. 
And Steve very nicely elucidated that many of our classic findings, which we relied on for years, have been improved by more sophisticated uh, interventions in the cath lab, looking clearly at whether or not it's restriction or um, uh, restriction of cardiomyopathy or constriction due to the pericardium. The other piece of data that we rely very heavily on is not just provided from the cath lab, but is provided by the use of other imaging techniques, such as magnetic resonant imaging or CAT scans, where we look specifically at the pericardium. And if it's thickened or if it's uh, calcified, it gives us some evidence that there may be a shell around the heart not allowing it to fill. So that, in combination with the hemodynamic da data, help us. Now, the second compounding factor is, the, is, the, is that there are so many people in the United States that have heart surgery. And one of the complications of heart surgery long term is that the pericardium is initially opened, but the, but, but the secondary healing of the pericardium to the surface of the heart due to the blood that may be in that cavity or simply scarring also gives us a whole new group of patients that end up with physiology due to fluid or scarring around their heart after heart surgery. And those may not have all of the classic findings either by CT scans or by hemodynamic data because it's fluid and not simply the pericardium. And yet those patients can dramatically be improved by relieving that fluid or that constriction. In most instances, because it's a mechanical problem, we will take the risk of surgery in order to see if we can relieve that constriction, if there's any doubt, because those patients do so dramatically well if we remove this constricted pericarditis. On the other hand, hopefully we haven't hurt them by simply exploring them, even if they have a cardiomyopathy due to the superb anesthetic techniques that we now uh, are, have the luxury of having in the operating room that are so safe. So when we then get to this point where we have physiology consistent with constriction, we then bring the patient to the operating room and under general anesthesia, open their breastbone. It's a preferred technique because it gives us access to their entire heart. And the actual sequencing of doing the pericardiectomy is important. If you simply unload the right ventricle and it can now dilate, but you remain with constriction around the left ventricle, the patients will have markedly elevated pressure in their lungs and actually go into what we call pulmonary edema or left-sided heart failure. So getting adequate exposure and initially doing your pericardiectomy by approaching the left ventricle and then the right ventricle um, is preferred. By doing that, we now have the opportunity to re relieve this constriction and give the heart the opportunity to now beat with its normal patterns of, of uh, contraction. It's interesting. We see two different patterns of responses then. One is in the operating room where we actually can see fairly dramatic improvements in their filling pressures. So the con central venous pressures that we saw in this particular patient, were, which were in the 25 to 30 range, almost immediately came down to around the 10 to 12 range. And I would suspect over time may come down into a more normal range of 5 to 10. There's another set of patients that we don't see the immediate dramatic effect because it may be some type of a mixed pattern. But over the next three months, we'll see very gradual but significant improvement by doing the pericardiectomy. And of course, there is a small group of patients, hopefully, that have a restrictive cardiomyopathy and that by removing the pericardium does not actually help them at all. And over time, the primary muscle disease is what we're dealing with and they'll therefore be evaluated for some type of an assist device, aggressive medical therapy, or transplantation. So it's a very interesting spectrum of disease that we deal with in these patients with heart failure. The pericardium is a very fascinating physiologic organ that is a girdle around the heart. In its best, in its best case scenario, it lubricates the heart and makes for a normal function of this heart that's constantly moving. It makes it so it's a, a nice bath for which um, the heart uh, beats. But in the worst case scenario where it doesn't move, it loses its flexibility, and it becomes a girdle, 
then it actually can impair significantly the function of the heart. And these patients, as you can see, can go for many years, as he did with four or five years, very high feeling pressure, fluid in the abdomen, elevated venous pressures, significant headaches, edema of their legs. And simply by removing the pericardium, they're dramatically better. So it's an interesting disease process. Thank you. Uh, I think we have a moment for a question or two, if we have any questions. Dr. Dean. Dr. Verrier mentioned there are other techniques such as MR, CT, and ECHO, and how, how are they used in the evaluation of these patients? Uh, thank you, Dr. Dean. That is a good question. I think that if a patient presents with classic right heart failure and on an imaging study has a thickening, a clear-cut thickening of the pericardium, that probably is sufficient information to uh, argue for surgery. Unfortunately, in the real world, things are not often quite so uh, cut and dry. Uh, there are several different uh, imaging uh, modalities uh, to uh, evaluate uh, constrictive pericarditis. Classically, of course, a chest X-ray may show uh, calcification, uh, but we don't see that very much anymore. That was more common with tuberculous pericarditis, which is not something we see so much. And even in its heyday, was only seen about 20% of the cases of constrictive pericarditis. Echocardiography is not very good for uh, delineating the thickness of the uh, pericardium, but is excellent in making a hemodynamic assessment. In fact, the information that I showed today uh, regarding the hemodynamic uh, cath lab data really came from the echocardiographers who went back to the cath lab to validate uh, their findings. CT and MRI are almost a univer uh, universally going to be done in a case such as this, looking for pericardial thickening. And unfortunately, we don't really know from the data how accurate these things are. The largest series that I found was 29 patients with either pericarditis or other cardiomyopathic processes, uh, so it was a small number. And uh, they found that uh, MRI scanning was about 88% uh, sensitive. Now, this came from the uh, University of California in San Francisco, a large academic medical center, seeing a lot of these cases. And I think that in centers that don't see large volumes, sometimes these can be a little bit uh, uh, tricky to appreciate. I showed you the characteristic findings of the coronary arteries that are seen in this patient. And finally, uh, we, in the cath lab, we can also perform right atrial angiography. Uh, where we see an abnormal uh, contour. Ordinarily, there is a very convex shape of the uh, right atrium, but uh, in this particular case, that was only slightly attenuated. But in addition, there is thickening of the, uh, be of the heart border between the um, uh, distal heart aspect as opposed to the endocardium, which has been outlined by the uh, contrast. That thickening is uh, characteristic of uh, constrictive pericarditis. All right, thank you very much for your attention. Dr. Dean? Again, I'd like to thank uh, all the presenters uh, for their excellent presentations this uh, morning and uh, for the audience for their um, participation and attendance and uh, attention. And we look forward to having you back at another Regional Heart Center Grand Rounds in the future. Thank you. Mm -hmm.